everybody. Thank you so much for coming uh, out in spite of the snow and the bad weather. We'll try to stay warm and positive in here. Um, I'm Sarah Blair. I don't work in a liberal arts college. I work here at the University of Michigan, um, and uh, I am um, an associate dean here in Rackham. It's my great pleasure to um, be able to help support this uh, programming, um, and I know that the colleagues who come to uh, talk about their experiences uh, and their view of teaching and life and scholarship at liberal arts institutions are um, you know, going to be a terrific help to, to everybody. Um, I'm really just here to moderate the conversation and help uh, direct questions. So um, I'm just going to begin by turning the microphone over to um, Andy. And I think each of the panelists will introduce herself or himself and um, we'll just carry on. Easier to run away if I'm already standing. <laughs> so, I'll have to do that. Uh, yeah, my name is Andy Mozena, and um, I teach in the English department at Kalamazoo College. My background is in both literature and creative writing. I um, want to thank uh, Sarah and uh, Laura for hosting and uh, promoting this program. Um, I want to say a little bit about what it's like for me teaching at a liberal arts institution, and then at the end, maybe give a little bit of a a pitch for the uh, postdoc uh, program that uh, Laura alluded to. Um, I might just start off with uh, placing liberal arts institutions uh, sort of geographically. Um, you might know this, but most liberal arts institutions are set in, in smaller places, smaller towns, um, uh, little cities. Um, that had a lot to do with how these institutions came about in the first place, and I, I won't uh, go too much into that, but it's something to be aware of when you're thinking about what the overall atmosphere of your work life is going to be like. If you really love a big city, if you really want to be coastal, um, you, you might have to commute a little bit, you might not have as many options. Okay, so um, I live in Kalamazoo, which actually turns out to be one of the larger metro areas to host a liberal arts college for about 250,000 people. But if you've ever visited Kenyon, you know, if you, you it's either into the ditch where the corn is or you hit the college there, <laughs> at the fork in the road, and there it is. And, and one of the consequences is that your social life, sometimes the college is the biggest institution, one of the bigger institutions in the town, um, your social life might be more likely to revolve around your department and the institution than, say, if you were in a big city. So that's just sort of a, a general thing to keep in mind. Um, one of the best things for me about working at a, at a liberal arts college is the, are the students and the level of student engagement. Um, at Kalamazoo, the students are really, really into, into classes. They really want to do well. Um, I don't know how they measure this, but Kalamazoo has uh, ranked 18th among all institutions, uh, R1s and liberal arts colleges, among the percentage of students who go on to graduate school, or who, who, who go on actually to earn PhDs. Okay, so these are unusually earnest students, and they will come prepared, they will, they will demand your time, um, and I imagine that some of you are the, you know, had been those students as, as undergrads. I imagine a number of you have been to those sorts of institutions, and maybe that's why you're here. Um, but that's a great benefit of, of teaching at a school like that. Students always want to be there. Classes are small. I've taught for 13 years and never had more than 22 in a class. So it's really, it's really a luxury, and, you, and getting to know students is a, is a great thing. Um, these students tend to be more adventuresome, I think. Um, Part of that is at a place like Kalamazoo, we have about 85% of our students uh, study abroad for roughly six months. So they come to that institution looking for a special educational experience, and that's another thing that makes them more engaged. Um, the division of time between teaching, research, and service, I'll just say a little bit about that. Um, liberal arts colleges, of course, have reputations as teaching institutions, and that will come first at most liberal arts institutions comes first at Kalamazoo, and you'll also be expected to publish. Okay, so I love that, personally. I love to be able to teach, and that I'm also going to, because you have to publish, you're going to get support to publish. A quarter up here, a quarter up there, sabbatical time. So it's, for some of you, it might be the best of both worlds, where you're keeping current, you're writing a book, 
every four, five, or six years. You're publishing regularly, but you're not, the, the bar is not obviously as high as it would be at a place like Michigan or other R1s, but you will do it. Um, I teach a 2 2 2 load, we're on the quarter system, as well as advising senior projects. So that, that's, that, that's very, for me, that's very challenging as a teaching load. Um, tenure, you won't necessarily have to have published a book, but some people have. I've seen successful tenure cases with um, three or four articles, uh, well placed. So that just gives you a ballpark. Um, service wise, um, you may not have heard, you, you're familiar probably with teaching and, and publishing, uh, maybe not as much with service. At, at a small institution, you will probably have to wear a lot more hats than, than you're used to. Um, I've had a rotation as a department chair. I've worked on the admissions committee. I was on a search for the chief financial, chief financial officer of the college. Um, I did a biology, biology department search. I worked on a committee that does health, health benefits and retirement planning. Um, I've been on a committee that does the college's budget. I've been on a committee that does the curriculum. Um, I, was, I adjudicate when students behave. Um, <laughs> you do everything but really go to their dorm rooms and make them lunch. I mean, if there's a lot of, <laughs> there are a lot of things you can get. get um, I mean, there's a good and bad side to that. What I love about the job is it takes every type of skill you might have ever developed because you have to play so many different roles. And if you don't want to play so many roles, you have to be kind of strategic and, and willing to say no. <laughs> so um, I've been teaching now at a, a liberal arts institution. I didn't go to one, but it's the only place I've taught since I finished grad school, and, and I've really, really loved it. And I've loved being in Kalamazoo. Who would have thought? <laughs> um, so that's, I'll just stop with those basics, because hopefully most of our time can be, on your, uh, be based on your questions. I'll just put in a plug for the, the postdoc program that Laura mentioned. Um, we will have uh, two postdocs a year at Kalamazoo. They will be um, teaching with us just for a year as, as the program is constituted now. And that usually means teaching half time, which is one course per quarter, and then having the rest of the time, the rest of the time to um, do your research. And unfortunately, as soon as you get would get their, you know, apply for, for, for jobs. Um, so it's a really great program. You'll have a, a dedicated mentor in, in, your, in your home department, and uh, I would encourage you all to think about applying. So uh, thanks for your attention, and I'll be happy to answer your questions, I guess, when we get to that as a group later. Thanks.
uh, you get to know their names, uh, you get to know uh, what they like, uh, and frequently uh, in, in these classes, uh, you get to really see them uh, discover your field uh, in a way that uh, is, is really uh, affirming, right? Um, uh, you can show them uh, what you do and make it enjoyable for them, and you can really, uh, I guess, watch them as they kind of discover the wonders uh, that, let's say, archaeology or Roman period Egypt uh, might, might hold for them. It's really uh, quite amazing. Uh, and there are a variety of classroom experiences uh, in which you interact with students, uh, both sort of in a lecture situation and a seminar situation. Uh, we also, uh, at Oberlin and at Kalamazoo, um, advise a lot of students and work with students on honors projects uh, and small one-on-one Interactions. So there are uh, a large number of, of places to sort of really um, uh, interact with students and, and uh, work closely with them. Um, at a liberal arts school as well, I think uh, you get to develop uh, relationships with faculty outside of your own discipline. And this can also be quite invigorating to your own scholarship. Um, at, a, at a large place like Michigan, I think you really meet your colleagues in your department, maybe the people that are down the other end of the hall that are in some related discipline. Uh, but at Oberlin, at least, uh, I know lots of chemists, uh, and, uh, and I know uh, people in art history and architecture, and interacting with them uh, frequently has helped my own scholarship, uh, because they can bring things to the table in discussions that I just have no idea about. Uh, and that can really, I think, help you uh, develop different ways to approach your material that can, uh, that can really be, from a research perspective, uh, quite, quite invigorating. Um, thirdly, uh, again, a bit dovetailing what Andy said, um, uh, at a liberal arts college, you really are invested in the institution. And I'm not meaning to say that people at Michigan aren't invested in, uh, in, the, in the way that, that Michigan operates. But at a liberal arts school, you're actually actively involved frequently in a lot of the decisions that determine the direction the, the college is going to go. Uh, so we have faculty meetings. Uh, it's all the faculty uh, at, at the college. Uh, and over the past year, we've been dealing with uh, the curriculum. So we've been voting on what are we going to require our students to learn. Uh, what things are important to us as an institution? Uh, important enough to make requirements for, for our educational goals. Uh, so that, I think, is really uh, engaging, because you really feel closely connected to the institution and want uh, what's best for the institution, um, which, of course, you do in R1 as well, but, uh, <laughs> but in a real, real personal way. Um, as well, you're involved in recruitment. Uh, as, as Andy said again, you know, you, uh, I, uh, it's pluses and minuses, or actually mostly pluses. Uh, we have lunches for uh, incoming students. We get to talk to them and their parents and answer all their parents' questions. Um, I also got to go on a nice little junket uh, to New York uh, to, to meet with students and faculty. So it's really quite, uh, quite exciting in that way. Uh, and graduation is uh, not just something that you hear about happening at the stadium, uh, but instead you, you go to graduation and you get to see all these students that you've taught uh, over the years graduate and receive their degree. If you do teach at a liberal arts school, I would strongly advise buying the attire. Um, <laughs> you actually use it, uh, really, every year. Uh, finally, um, I, I would uh, note that whatever, if you go to a liberal arts, if you end up at a liberal arts institution, uh, you should make sure you keep in mind um, that the expectations for reaching in, uh, research and teaching do vary widely. Um, and what that means for you is both the expectations of what you should achieve may vary, but it also means that you might need to tailor your own expectations of your own work to meet the resources and opportunities that the institution can provide. Uh, and I think that's something that's important to keep in mind, is that um, you might want to, let's say, from a science perspective maybe, uh, run a mouse lab, uh, which involves you know, hundreds of mice studying some protein. But if you're at a small liberal arts school that doesn't have a mouse facility, uh, it's going to be really difficult to actually achieve that sort of research um, and publish in nature. Uh, instead, you're going to need to kind of tailor your own work and your own expectations of what you can accomplish to the situation that you're in. So anyway, again, uh, I, like everyone else, welcome your questions and look forward to it.
Michigan grad. Um, I'm in my fourth year now um, at Allegheny, um, and I wanted to also plug um, some of CRLT's programs, um, particularly the mentorship program, which I participated in um, and was really, really valuable for me in terms of thinking about my career, but I think it also really helped me get my job. So, um, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, some really good things came out of that for me. Um, and also the Preparing Future Faculty, the PFF seminars, um, were really useful for me thinking about as I was going out on the market um, and having some resources prepared for that. Um, so, um, like some of our other panelists, I came out of liberal arts um, as an undergraduate. I went to Carleton College, um, and I, um, from the time I started grad school, I knew that I wanted to be at a, a, a school similar to the one that I had gone to. And so when I went out on the market, I was really focused pretty much just on the liberal arts market. Um, and I feel fortunate that it worked out. <laughs> um, I thought I'd talk about, um, I, I certainly echo everything um, that my two predecessors said. Um, I thought that I would focus on a couple of things that are different, um, or that maybe you haven't encountered um, as a GSI or, um, or or working here at Michigan. Um, and um, Andy mentioned already service, I think, um, and Rue as well. Um, <laughs> you're going to start doing committee work really early. Um, uh, for us, it's in our second year, although usually you sort of informally get the second year off, um, and it really starts in your third year. Um, but I've already served on two college-wide committees. Um, I'm on a search on in another department as the outside member this uh, semester. Um, so you're going to be busy with that in ways that um, you don't really anticipate sort of when you think about balancing your time. Um, I, I wholly echo everything that these guys said about your relationship with your students. It's amazing working with these students um, and watching them grow and getting to know them. Um, one thing that um, it can be a fun part of that relationship is advising. Um, you, you get to know your advisees particularly well. Um, they will come into your office and tell you things that you did not want to know about them, and <laughs> you will be left, unless you're like in a counseling program, totally unequipped to deal with that. Um, but you also, I mean, when they graduate after four years, you like feel like they're parents. You're so proud of them. And, um, that relationship can really be a lot of fun. Um, you also spend a lot of time uh, working with students on senior projects. I think almost every liberal arts college has sort of one of the hallmarks is there's some sort of senior project of some sort. Um, for us, it's, it's a thesis project. I know Kay has a, a similar sort of thesis um, that the students work on over the course of usually a year, sometimes more, sometimes it's just a semester. Um, but advising those projects can be um, incredibly fun. You watch your students really grow as scholars and, and start to, I mean, it's really, for most of them, the first time that they've really done a major independent research project. Um, and that's a great experience to be part of. Um, it's also a huge time suck. Um, and, you know, that's something I think, as, as again, um, I, I wanted to highlight things that maybe you haven't thought of, but, you know, that's, that's something that I certainly didn't really anticipate um, spending the time on that I do. Um, I think one difference um, between teaching at a liberal arts college and being at a big R1 is the institutional support for teaching and the emphasis on teaching. Like, you have to be a good teacher uh, in order to get tenure, and the institution helps you do that. Um, you know, there are, there, are, there are resources to go to pedagogy workshops, there are things on campus. Um, you get observed by colleagues um, who offer hopefully constructive feedback, um, and um, you know that that's really valued as as a legitimate and important use of your time and effort. Um, I have found as well that um, I think going into this, there was sort of this narrative that well, you're not really going to be able to do much research because you're going to be teaching all the time, um, and you know I. For sure, when I was doing nothing but research and writing my dissertation, like I got a lot done, <laughs> more than I get done now. But um, I, I do, I, I think you find a balance, and I, I feel like I've, I'm being reasonably productive. And I also feel like there's a lot more institutional support for research than sort of the narrative sometimes would suggest. Um, we have what I think is actually a generous funding package um, for sort of startup funds for your own research. Um, a lot of liberal arts colleges, including Allegheny, 
are really starting to emphasize undergraduate research as well. So you can get research assistants um, that are you know paid for by the college sometimes, or um, you know there, there's credit um, varying ways that that can work. Um, and you know we have, we have a good conference travel budget. Um, so so that's been I think for me a really pleasant surprise and something that I, I kind of knew what the teaching piece looked like, but I, I uh, on the research side I wasn't really expecting that. So. Again, I like everybody. I welcome your questions. Hi, everyone. My name is Emma Guama. Uh, I'm a PhD. I got my PhD here in uh, December 2010 from anthropology and history, and I'm teaching now at Auburn in um, history department. Uh, thank you so much, Sarah and Laura, for inviting me here. It's been a pleasure always to be back in Anarcho. It's my second home and I always feel like that. Um, so I'm an awesome postdoc at Auburn this year. Um, and I have to say that I loved it. Uh, and I will just give you some of the reasons why I'm basically in love with that place. <laughs> um, and of course, I would definitely develop some of the points uh, in the Q&A, but I think I would want you to give, I want to give um, you a more uh, practical, down to earth sense of what it feels to be there. Uh, definitely students are absolutely wonderful, they are very curious, they are very engaged, um, and it's absolutely a pleasure to, to teach them. Uh, there are also specific resources uh, at Auburn, um, and there are some, for instance, specific research grants that you as an OCUM, uh, which means also that you are visiting a system professor, are eligible to apply. Um, so there are some, there, are, there is an additional institutional support that you would also be able to benefit. Uh, in addition to this, I think a, a, a crucial element of the program is the level of mentorship that you receive. Uh, for instance, um, last semester I was able to um, have to, to be able to attend several classes uh, in the history department, uh, as well as have two faculty attend my classes and offer me feedback on specific things that I could improve uh, during my teaching. I also uh, received mentorship in terms of having three members of the um, of the department. Um, Write my, uh, write my dissertation and offer me feedback on how to really pursue uh, transforming dissertation to a book. So very, very practical, very practical, wonderful support. Um, at Oberlin also, as part of the Ohio college system, you also benefit from Ohio Link. So of course you won't have Hatcher, this wonderful you know, empire of books. It's a much smaller, <laughs> much smaller library. However, precisely because it's part of your higher league, you have uh, you have possibility of getting uh, things in your hands, like articles and uh, books, within a much uh, shorter time framework than through the interlibrary loan. So sometimes this helps. Uh, very, very important. Um, I think if you uh, plan to uh, be, uh, if you if you apply to, if you plan to apply for this uh, wonderful postdoc and get the postdoc, start thinking already of what you want to teach already the summer before you get there. Just because it's going to be a reduced teaching load, but it's definitely is going to be uh, a time when you will experience with, with when you will really want to teach the dream class, yeah? Mm -hmm. And this is what I did, and I'm really happy that I can do that. But in order for you to teach the dream class, it's important to know, first of all, what that dream class would be before you start changing the syllabus right before the class starts. Uh, because you really want to put lots of stuff in the, uh, in the class, and sometimes you just, you know, want to really use that opportunity, opportunity fully. Um, you see there are any other things that I would like to see? Um, also, for instance, in my case, uh, there is definitely a reduced teaching load, uh, but I would also be able, you will also be able to do a, uh, of course, this is really your choice, uh, to do a private reading with students. So, for instance, I'm going to teach only one class, it's going to be full enrollment, 35 students, but then I will also do a private reading 
uh, on a subject that really I care about, but it's not, it's not, it's not part of the program. But I think it will really definitely help me develop my teaching uh, portfolio. So, so there are lots of opportunities for you to explore as as a postdoc. Uh, and of course, there will be some time for you to do research. But I think probably. Realistically speaking, you won't probably have so much time to focus on writing as much as on writing job letters and job applications in fall, during the fall semester and then focus on getting more writing done uh, during, the, during the winter and spring. So, um, yeah, any other questions? I'm here. Thank you. <laughs> A great way to start the conversation off. Um, I think we should move right into questions that have resulted um, from things the panelists have said. Um, we can just have at it. And I'm afraid we really need to use microphones, so be patient. Okay. Uh, my question was, um, I come from a background that has very little to do with liberal arts colleges. Uh, I grew up in Australia, so it's was quite foreign to me until I came to North America. Um, to what extent do you think that um, someone like me would be at a disadvantage in, in applying? Um, I think um, for this goes for you know anybody that well anybody period um, but particularly if you didn't go to can you hear me okay yeah okay particularly if you didn't go to a liberal arts college as an undergrad. Um, and, and can't sort of credibly say that you've lived through the experience and you know what it's like. I mean, I think I, we unfortunately have had a set of people retire and such. Um, so this is my fifth year of serving on a search somewhere across the college, either in my own department or another. So I can credibly say that we're looking for people that know what they're getting into. Um, and so I think if you haven't gone to a liberal arts college to the extent that you have teaching experience, Talk about that. Show that you enjoy teaching, that you care about teaching, that you value it. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, obviously anybody that's got a PhD that's from, you know, not a liberal arts college, because um, they don't grant PhDs by definition. Um, and, and so, you know, we understand that sort of that's, you know, going to be at best, uh, you know, a small part of your experience. but. Try to get whatever teaching experience you can, either as a GSI, um, if you can get um, the sole instructor positions in your department, um, those are really good. Um, that was something that for me, I did through the mentorship program at Kalamazoo College um, my last year here. Um, I, I had my own classes there. So whatever you can pursue to sort of signal that you're serious about teaching and interested in teaching, um, do it. <laughs> I would add to that that you can just step right out and you're, I didn't go to a liberal arts college, so it wasn't a, I didn't even know what they were, honestly, before I started applying to them. <laughs> but um, I think it's really good if in your job letter you speak to the nature of the institution, even if it's just a couple of sentences, ideally you'll read up a little bit about the, that place and so you can speak, because colleges will reveal their philosophy in a paragraph or two on their website. and. Um, Lining yourself up with that, like Kalamazoo is a very internationally oriented school. You could say, as an Australian, you know, I bring I, I can bring internationalism or something like that. And then you can also say, um, I value what liberal arts. In, in effect, you say I value what liberal arts colleges value. So whether you've been there or not, the fact that you're speaking to the institution in its own language really goes a long way in your job letter. And people who don't. It's very, you've got 250 applications, okay? You're looking for reasons to reject people, sorry. But when people don't speak to your institution and the other credentials are not, a, you know, if they're on the border, then that's a, that can be a decision moment. So it is really good to address that in your job letter. I would, I would completely agree that the uh, speaking to the institution, being familiar with, is that, is that good? Being familiar with the, uh, the school that you're applying to, Actually, you know, mentioning it by name, uh, these things are critical in, in a job application. And whether you've gone to a liberal arts school uh, or not, showing that you have had some familiarity with what it's like, um, I would say if you could, you know, participate in the mentorship that the, the CRLT offers. Uh, since you don't have any experience there, you know, go down for a day uh, and shadow someone uh, in your in your field if you can. Um, 
try and get some experience that you're, you're familiar with it and then, you know, talk about that. And that, that makes you just as qualified as, as any other candidate. Well, I'm a Romanian. I got my uh, BA in psychology in 
how that might affect curriculum, et cetera, what you think in 20 years the liberal arts college might be like in, in the United States? That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I think, I don't know. I, I feel like at Overland, we feel like we offer uh, a very specific uh, student-tailored educational system that can never be replicated with an online situation, with an online course, uh, and is very different from what people get at um, at, uh, at a place like Michigan. Um, I think the, the key for us uh, as, uh, as liberal arts uh, uh, institutions is um, we really tailor, our, tailor ourselves to students, and I think more and more parents are pretty involved in, in education and in choices, and they want to send their student, their child, to a place that has that kind of individual care. Um, and that, I don't know, I, I don't really worry about our future as such, because I think we provide this, this real, tangible uh, product, if you will. I mean, I hate thinking about education as, 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 a, as capitalist, but, but, but I think we still do. Um, I don't like it. I would just jump in. Microphone is on. I would just jump in to say that um, from the perspective of a kind of administrative substratum where com these conversations are going on all the time, um, there's a, a great deal of anxiety among uh, education professionals and people responsible for administering higher, higher education about um, access and that MOOCs are often seen, um, whether we like this or not, whether this is a good idea or not, as um, a kind of instrumental way to address problems of access. Um, but they're not, I think, seen universally or even you know, primarily as a way to deal with the challenges of preparing students for an increasingly globalized um, uh, information economy in which real analytic and critical skills are going to be more important rather than less important. Um, so there's a lot of emphasis on the MOOC model, the scaling up model, but there's renewed interest in the liberal arts model as well and the kind of education it can deliver, the kind of preparation it can give students. And again, we may not love the rhetoric of that, but I think that's one conversation, um, one direction that this conversation will probably keep taking. I just got a quick question actually about um, curriculum. Not having gone to a liberal arts college, I'm wondering about balance that you see for your students in terms of um, bread and butter courses, as it were, covering the real basics. Um, as opposed to more thematic, uh, more focused seminars. Many of you spoke about how um, your students are engaged and adventurous, and I'm wondering how in a job letter, for example, we might want to talk about our ability to teach the introductory courses at the same time, more advanced seminars. Um, at a place like Kalamazoo, I've been able to do both, and just the way you put it, I think is a really good way to put it. Um, you might have to teach across more areas at a liberal arts institution just because departments will be so small and you might have to step out and, and cover something that you may not have studied in grad school. Having said that, I well, next year I'll teach six courses and they will all be, I have two different graduate, a creative writing degree and a lit degree, but they will all be in the sweet spot of my degrees, all six courses, okay? But that does, that, that's maybe lucky. But being able to talk about how, how you can teach the broader, more survey-like courses as well as, hey, I really love this topic, and your students will want to follow you deeply into that senior seminar or, or junior seminar. Yeah, you definitely can do that at a liberal arts place. I mean, I think you have to, you have to teach the surveys, usually in most departments, right? So that's a good thing to expect going into it. I am a modern Europeanist, um, but and I did not have the, you know, I did not have the idea of doing this, but now that I'm looking backwards, I think it's very important for you to try GSI for a class, or maybe two, that uh, would not be, you know, part of your area of expertise, because that would definitely be a class for you. So teaching GSI for, you know, a, a, a class on the history, modern history of Middle East, for you as a modern Europeanist, I'm just you know, uh, making a scenario, it would be very, very, it will really show that you are curious and then you have potential and then you are definitely open open to uh, teaching that kind of thing. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
uh, campus visit if you actually are a finalist, um, and how what how you evaluate those candidates. Um, I know I'm, I'm giving a research talk, I'm doing a teaching demo, I'm meeting with the school of faculty. It looks the same on the schedule as an as a research visit, but how do you consider these candidates um, specifically from your perspective? Well, I think we um, at Oberlin uh, perhaps. Let's see. Uh, we, we certainly involve our students a lot more, maybe, uh, in terms of how they react to faculty members. Uh, so, and we, we almost always schedule interactions between the candidate and the students. Um, so that certainly, I think, is a, is a critical difference in terms of how you would present yourself to them, and, and, as well as the faculty. Uh, how your talk, uh, as well, is, uh, is tailored to, um, to be very more less specialized, let's say, than, and more accessible to a broader range. Um, those, I think, are, are probably critical ways that we would evaluate a candidate coming to about their suitability. Um, I would, um, I guess, add on to the piece about students is, um, in my department, we solicit the students' feedback after they've met with the candidate, right? So, you know, don't, I take that part seriously, I think. Um, there's another department at Allegheny that will go unnamed that actually lets the students vote, um, which many of the rest of us think is insane. But, um, <laughs> but you know, I mean, I, I take that part seriously, I think. Um, I would say the, the second thing that I would add um, to what Drew said is just that, you know, it's probably a small department. And so we're looking also at sort of collegiality and, and what, I mean, you know, we're going to be working with you as one of, four to ten people maybe, potentially for the next 30 years, right? And so, um, you know, teaching and research matter the most, but collegiality and how we think that sort of relationship is going to evolve certainly matters at the margins. Just one more thing to add to those who think that are also true at Kalamazoo is that we will ask people to talk about their, their research in terms of how it informs their teaching. And, and how they would, sort of getting a sense for how they would bring what they, what the candidates looked into so deeply on their own, how they bring that to students. What's their style of doing that? What's their style of bringing students into their world and getting students to do comparable work, especially because we try to set up senior research projects. And um, I've seen uh, candidates, when we, we will explicitly ask them to, to add that piece at the end of their research talk to talk about how it relates to their teaching. And some candidates simply don't do that. And it's, it, again, it's very easy to say, OK, that's a decision point. So just make sure, make sure you do that. I know there was a question. Um, I wanted to ask how, um, uh, a little bit more about how um, opportunity for um, interaction and cooperation with faculty from outside of your discipline um, affects your teaching. Can everyone here in the back of the room? Can everyone hear the question? Great. Well, uh, do you mean context or content? Like, oh, you both. Uh, so, so uh, um, we would go out, I would go out with a, a number of people for, for a drink on a Friday, and we would chat. Uh, and it was very casual, uh, and oftentimes the, the sort of integration begins in a casual way. Um, that, you know, so for my work, as I said, I know a lot of chemists. Um, I became interested in doing some scientific testing on some artifacts. I could talk to the chemists, so I had an automatic end that would sort of I could work with them in that way. Um, otherwise, uh, I have a colleague in art history um, who's an architect, and I began work on a project that, that intersected with architecture. And I went to John uh, and I said, "John, this is my project. You know, can you suggest some readings that I could do?" Uh, and he suggested them. I read them, we then talked about it, and it became really um, uh, a way for me to look in a very different way at my own, my own work. And I, I just think that that is a very individual or special uh, interaction that I could have. At, at the what for instance, um, a class that I taught uh, in the fall semester, in the fall semester was on history and memory in uh, 20th century Europe. Uh, it's a broad topic, and that's really an interdisciplinary topic. Uh, and also there are some other scholars who work on topics of memory and post-conflict societies and so on. And so I was really trying to focus 
bring in some of the uh, information and discussion that I got from these workshops into the class. Another way that I felt um, it was so um, productive for me to be in such a relatively small intellectual environment, uh, a very vibrant intellectual environment, was that I would be able to uh, go and offer a, um, a lecture in, to visit a class. So I was, I was basically an invited guest, guest speaker for a class uh, on architectural history. So she's doing the she, she, she was a, a class on architectural history, but it just turns out that my talk, my dissertation topic, also dealt with politics of architecture, and so I gave I gave a lecture on that. What was very practical for, for, practical for me was that I was speaking to a group of students uh, who were not really history majors, and I realized that in order for me to really clarify my talk, I really needed more context, more. So it was really very, very, very helpful. So my question is about uh, career trajectories for faculty at liberal arts colleges. Uh, probably everyone in this room would agree that your first job is really important and sort of like path dependence that grows out of it. I'm wondering though, to what extent um, you see faculty, you know, colleagues of yours leaving the liberal arts environment and going to larger research universities, or do you find people sort of midway in their um, R1 careers finding jobs at liberal arts colleges, you feel like maybe at the, you know, it's sort of East is East and West is West, and that's how career trajectories look, so. Uh, at my institution, I think I've seen a little bit more of people moving from R1s to the liberal arts setting. Um, sometimes, uh, even though you do publish in liberal arts institutions, once you get to a certain point in your career, you, you're not publishing at the rate sometimes that you need to be publishing at to, to keep up at that level, if you're an associate level, you might not transfer very well into an R1 at that point. I think I've seen the, op the opposite more often in Oberlin, where we have people who have been in Oberlin and have, have moved up, uh, as it were, uh, to an R1 uh, institution. Uh, I mean, they tend to be people who are, you know, as Andy said, publishing a lot, you know, so, or, or producing publications that are really uh, marked uh, and Distinctive. Um, so I think there is some movement. A lot of times, though, the movement happens before tenure. Uh, I think post tenure movement becomes a lot more difficult um, until you get into the, you know, full professor area. Um, can you speak out to the diversity of the student body and of your colleagues, how that might vary from a big university like this to a liberal arts school? Um, so I'll start this, I guess, because we're having, as part of our, uh, we have a new strategic plan, and part of that is sort of increasing um, diversity. Um, it's way less diverse than the University of Michigan. Um, <laughs> that's for sure. Um, Allegheny, I think, is um, maybe a little different than at least my perception of Kay and Oberlin um, in that we have a great deal of socioeconomic diversity, um, which is, I think, a function of where we're located in northwestern Pennsylvania, where the steel market crashed. 30 years ago and it's never come back. Um, and um, and so we, we sort of have a different type of diversity that's not maybe readily visible. Um, and we're, we're working on ways to, to boost diversity that is perhaps more readily visible um, in a lot of different ways and thinking about also internationalizing um, the campus a little bit more. Um, but it's a much wider environment than the University of Michigan and that's just um, that's the way it is, although most of us aren't happy about that. I think it's a real concern at a lot of liberal arts schools, and uh, you know, largely the, the impetus to, to change that does come from the top, uh, from the administration to, to focus on uh, increasing diversity. At Oberlin, we, we, um, we spend a lot of fellowship money attempting to, uh, trying to increase diversity, uh, both economic and uh, all sorts of all sorts of uh, diversities, um, 
but that's that that really is is something that is a is a struggle. And in part, you know, I think it does come back to the question we had earlier about the survival of liberal arts. We tend to be more expensive, you know, and um, and the school has to sort of set as their own goal, you know, making the education affordable in some ways uh, for, for for some groups of people. But it is it is something that I think is a is, a, is always on. Uh, at Kalamazoo, um, again, we would like to be more diverse than we are. I think we, we tend to do better with uh, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender diversity. Um, racial diversity is getting a little bit better. Religious diversity is getting a little bit better. Um, and that's happening uh, both on the student side and on the faculty side. Um, we brought in a fairly, we brought in our largest in, uh, class of international students um, a few years ago, so that's helping. and. Um, yeah, it's something we're really, we're really focused on. For those of you who are interested in uh, doing research on the um, communities um, involved in the, the you know, different liberal arts institutions that you might be looking at, one resource, um, I, I can't believe I'm recommending this, uh, data, um, I'm, a, I'm a narrative person, not a data person, um, and I would always be careful about uh, data sources, usually um, data on student demographics, there's usually a real lag between what you can see published, even on the web, and what's really going on on the ground. Um, but there, there's a useful kind of uh, relational or comparative uh, sort of sense you can get of liberal arts institutions. And Forbes actually uh, published a recent study um, based on you know, pretty reliable data. And you can look at liberal arts colleges, um, the top you know, 200 liberal arts colleges in the US and North America, actually and uh, get information about underrepresented minority students, about um, sexual identity of students, about the number of students at a given institution who have received Pell Grants, um, which is an indicator of socioeconomic status, um, about all sorts of diversities, about graduation rates, um, and you can get a snapshot view of the institution um, and get a sense of the challenges that face those institutions, which may or may not be different from the challenges that face elite institutions of all kinds, whatever their size, whatever their scope, whatever their funding mechanisms. So I think it is worth doing a little bit of that research to get a sense of how institutions, whether frankly there are ones or liberal arts colleges, um, uh, how they account for the mission um, that, that they've undertaken, how they tell a story about what kind of student community, what kind of faculty community they are, how they look to enrich their diversity and um, to speak to the challenges of creating better access. A quick question, hopefully, just really practical. Especially as an assistant professor, how much flexibility or control do you have or not have over your schedule when you're teaching, when you know, do committees meet in the evening, things like that? Um, okay, so this is my favorite thing about Allegheny, and it's totally not universal to liberal arts colleges um, or even um, to other departments at Allegheny, but um, our chair stands up every semester, like every year when we pick our schedules and says, what do you want to teach and when do you want to teach it? Um, so we have complete control over that. Um, but that varies a lot um, by department. Um, I think that's something to ask if you get interviews. Um, I, we also have a very vocal group of parents that really defend sort of evening hours and work-life balance. Um, and so nothing happens in the evenings, and let the, you know, I mean, like public lectures do, but you don't have to go to those. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, um, yeah. Oh, I would say pretty much exactly the same thing about Kalamazoo. And, and Oberlin as well. I mean, there's a, there's, there's a lot of, Horse trading, we call it, you know, between the divine deciding with where, where, when you're going to teach and what. But. Regarding the postdocs at uh, Kalamazoo and Oberlin, how appropriate and feasible would those positions be for someone who does field research internationally and would like to continue to do so? Planning to do that research. Well, so I think uh, I think Andy mentioned that it would maybe be a one 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 kind of a reduced teaching load, but you'd be teaching every semester. Is it possible to fudge that such that you're teaching you know a couple classes one semester and then? 
Yeah, that's one of the hard things. I mean, you could potentially work that out with your department. Um, the, the Great Lakes Colleges Association, which I think all three of us, our institutions belong to, have a, have a program where um, you, there are international partners where, say, you had a, uh, some, some research you needed to do in uh, Cairo, Egypt. There might be an institution in this consortium that you could then spend a semester there as part of your assignment at Kalamazoo. So there are great opportunities to do international field work within, within the GLCA. Whether that's feasible to get up and running and taken care of within the span of a one-year postdoc, that might, that might be iffy. Um, but who knows? Uh, we do all kinds of international stuff, so sometimes things work out unexpectedly. Or, or you can do a little bit over a break. Like we may need somebody, we have all these study abroad sites all over the country, so if your research is near one of those study abroad sites, you might take uh, the winter, or we have a long winter break, um, about a month between Thanksgiving and New Year's where we're off. You might pitch a research trip that you could also serve the institution by visiting our study abroad sites, and we could, we could work something out. <laughs> so, but it would have to be kind of like that. wonderful winter project of January, which means I didn't know before I got there. Uh, so that means that basically um, the winter break starts before Christmas, uh, and then it becomes a certain kind of break slash research focus uh, work time for the faculty, because the, uh, sem the spring semester starts on uh, the beginning of February, on February 3rd. So in general, generally speaking, there are lots of faculty who also could travel during the entire month of January, especially for people not focusing uh, on international uh, research sites, and uh, when they also can do can do some field, field research. And there is also this uh, uh, powers grants, uh, which uh, visiting our system professors are also eligible to apply. Uh, it's very important for uh, for you to apply in the fall, so that you, if you are lucky to get it, uh, then you will be able to do to use it as additional uh, funding support during January. I have a question about interdisciplinary scholarship. I know you've touched on this some, but as someone with a very multi multidisciplinary background, and now I'm in an interdisciplinary PhD program, I'm wondering how that plays out practically in the job market at a at a school with very small with small departments. Um, in terms of, you know, I'm in political science, but a lot of political scientists might see my work as too interdisciplinary, not political science enough. So maybe how to how that plays out and how you could frame that in job materials to. Well, literally, like, which side do you want to hear first? <laughs> the ones applying for jobs or the ones hiring? So. Uh, well, uh, yeah, I'll okay. go ahead. All right. Uh, well, so far, I'm still uh, too much on the interdisciplinary uh, side. So that is, uh, I. I fear that even though I'm teaching in the history department, given my training in anthropology and history, and very important point, my advisor was an anthropologist, is an anthropologist. So I'm not, I'm already becoming more of a weirdo than I, than I, than I was a year ago. <laughs> and the only condition for me to really try to find a, a disciplinary home would be really for me to have an article or two published in the discipline that I want to apply, so I want to really develop my career in. Uh, so far I have two articles published in anthropology journals, and I already saw the uh, consequences of this. I'm too much of an anthropologist to be able to, uh, to apply and be considered a historian. Uh, and I wish I knew this before I really entered the job market this year, because I, I, I would have applied for more anthropologists than history. Um, so there are all these very fine details that become very important. It's hard. I mean, I think uh, 
you know, interdisciplinarity is one of the big buzzwords now, and um, we all like it in theory, and practically speaking, it becomes hard. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, no, it is hard. It's, it's, it's just very difficult. Uh, but you, I guess, one, one important thing, though, to remember is that your research and teaching are not the same, right? You know, you teach one thing, uh, and you can do your own research, which is very interdisciplinary, uh, interdisciplinary. but your, your teaching can be something that is disciplinary, right? And you should pitch yourself, I think, as having a discipline uh, to get a job. Uh, but you can talk about how you break out of that discipline uh, and can uh, establish connections with other disciplines. Uh, but I think in the liberal arts, we're still pretty discipline-bound uh, by necessity, because we have to teach these core things. Um, so, yeah, you just have to be comfortable teaching inside this. Sorry. I would just like to follow up upon Tulu's point. Uh, for instance, speaking of my, my, my experience as an author postdoc, I really also took this time as an amazing opportunity for me, for me to explore how it would feel to bring in, um, say, a 400 level class on history and memory taught in the history department, things that had not been really, had not been really you know, part of this historiography. They would really be more interdisciplinary type of texts. So I brought in some, some things from comparative literature, from anthropology, and they loved it. So, but it was also, again, an, op an amazing opportunity for me. I'm not sure if I'm going to have this opportunity again, but the very fact that I had it, I was like, okay, I'm going for it. So, and they went with me. So. <laughs> I think one thing to um, ask about when you're on the market um, to talk to schools about is how you're evaluated at tenure. I mean, I think that's maybe where my <laughs> comment about it just being really hard comes in is, I think that's where I see the main um, challenges for folks I know that are more interdisciplinary is who's evaluating you and how qualified are they? I mean, if your department is made up of people that are very traditionally within the discipline, are they able to evaluate interdisciplinary work in a way that is good for you? Um, and, and what happens if, if they're not? Um, I think the other thing to do if you have the time is to look at each, each institution you're applying to and look at both what the job description is asking you to cover, and then also look at what the what the general ed situation is at the college. So at Kalamazoo, we have um, three general ed seminars that everybody has to take, a first year, a sophomore, and a senior seminar. And the, those three courses are all um, supposed to be kind of interdisciplinary. Okay, so if you could say, you want to be able to ground yourself in the job description in terms of what classes your home department wants you to teach, but then for applying to us, it would be great if you could say, my experience in this would allow me to teach a really great interdisciplinary senior seminar, which I see you happen to have in here. <laughs> you know, so doing it at that level is a, is a good way to solve it. And, and you know, I just put that in. Um, all of us in, in the room, you know, we're, and you guys too, we're all professors or going to be professionally but not all of the students are necessarily going to be on that track. How do you deal with advising students that want to go into the real world or have lives that are very different from anything that we do? I mean, I think that, that probably 90% or more of our students aren't going on right. in, in the profession, right? I mean, I, I teach classics. They don't, you know. <laughs> I think I should, you know, you know, you know, definitely not, you know. But uh, I, I just, uh, I mean, the ones who do definitely should do it, you know, and succeed. Uh, but um, no, I, I just keep in mind the I make sure that they know that their degree is worth a lot, right, and that they can do any variety of things. And I think people get trapped in this idea that they are pre-professional, right, and that they are they have to they have to study some something that then leads directly to a job. And I just try and continually encourage my students, we're preparing you for life, right? The liberal arts degree, or college in general, uh, often just prepares you to be able to make decisions, to analyze data, to think about uh, uh, different paths to accomplish the same goal. Um, and I think helping them to see that they are learning all these things, um, even if they're not directly applicable, uh, helps them to feel good about applying widely for jobs mm -hmm. until they find them. Um, okay, there we go. Maybe that, is that better? Okay, so my question is about working.
talking with students in an interdisciplinary context. My fantasy of a liberal arts school is that you would get a fuller sense of who your students are as people outside of the departmental context. I was wondering if you can comment on that a little bit. Um, is that a fantasy or does that actually happen and how? Oh, you definitely get to know them. I just wrote a recommendation for somebody that I had had in five classes. And I also directed a senior project. So that raises a whole separate issue with what's wrong with this student. But <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you really get to know um, you really get to know them well. And that just to go back to the previous question, that's part of how you can talk to them about what it is this education is for for them. So you yes, both. Well, I think you also, I mean, in advising, you get to know them as people um, in ways you, you don't in the classroom. But I mean, I also, I don't know about you guys, but I advise a couple student groups, so I see them very much outside the classroom. It's a very, very different context. Um, one of them is like a living learning community, uh, and one of them is Bali United Nations. So, um, you know, I think you definitely get to know your students as people. <laughs> And something that Andy said in the introduction I think is also quite relevant here. A lot of liberal arts schools are in small towns. Um, and sometimes you see them too much. Really. Um, <laughs> Oberlin's 8,000 people. And um, I see my students all the time. And two cafes. <laughs> right, right, right. We have two cafes, one bar, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, one voice at the Oberlin, there is also a responsibility of having your students, having lunch with your students once per semester. So what I did is, because I taught a 400 level seminar that had actually had a smaller involvement, I had students, uh, I invited them for lunch, and part of this lunch was covered by, by the college. It was a very nice way to, you know, round up a whole semester of discussion with things about what they do uh, besides, you know, learning hard for this class. I was able, I mean, following up on that, I was able to take my students, bring my students here, actually. I had a, taught a small seminar on uh, Roman period Egypt and brought all my students to the Kelsey Museum, which was a really great sort of close, uh, close experience. But yeah, I mean, there, there are, your fantasy is, is in many ways correct. <laughs> they also invite you to do cute things, like come to their music performances <laughs> and their Watch dance the shows and, and weddings and... <laughs> So we, a few of their children. Oh, sorry. <laughs> we have a little less than 10 minutes, so I think we have time for one or two more questions. I see two hands up here. All right, I wanted to get back to the postdoc again, just to ask about that. Uh, I guess specifically the Collins or Overland, but it could apply to other places. I'm trying to, I'm thinking about what kind of objectives one has in applying for a postdoc at such a place. I can easily imagine a postdoc at you know, UC Berkeley, Yale, or whatever, and I have a sort of a valid reason for why I want to continue research, etc., in that context. And you've described sort of teaching prioritized situations. So would a person who seeks a postdoc at, let's say, Oberlin or what have you, is that because I really want the liberal arts experience as a postdoc, or is my dissertation and current you know, U of M situation, is it still relevant as something that I'm continuing, or am I really trying to leave it behind? You know, I would like to think, imagine that I'm sort of like, oh, I'd like to publish this dissertation, and I want to do that in between the teaching and the, you know, everything else. Yeah, I, I hope I, I wish I'd made that a little more clear. So you're, you're basically half teaching half research at, uh, during the postdoc. So you're, you're not teaching a full load with the idea that you will continue your research. Um, practically, because of the job market, your fall term is usually spent on preparing for the job market. But then you would have more time to do, to do research at that point. Um, part of it is getting, getting more teaching experience. Um, if you don't have a liberal arts background and you want to end up in a liberal arts institution, it credentializes you for that. And the, I should have said when I introduced it uh, before, it's been very successful in uh, catapulting people to great jobs. Um, just in the past 10 years, just from Kalamazoo, uh, somebody got a job at Williams, somebody got a job at Mount Holyoke. Um, on the R1 side, or Earl, somebody just got a job at Earlham. On the R1 side, uh, West Virginia University, uh, Wayne State University. So it's, it, it gives you, and just 
speaking from the point of view of somebody who's looking at people who are applying for jobs, it's often those people who have more teaching experience, more chance of publications, and um, you just have more time to develop the type of resume that will get you the interview or, or get you into the, some of the finalist positions. So just another layer of credentialization, I guess. Yeah. And also, I mean, the mentoring opportunities are very deep uh, in terms of getting to know faculty who have been there for a while and can really help you uh, as you prepare your own work uh, for publication or for submitting to, say, a press. Um, and I think uh, this teaching experience at Overland and Kalamazoo, these schools are looked at as, as real teaching-centered places. So whether you're applying to an R1 or to a liberal arts, your resume looks like you know how to teach because you have had that experience. You know, so I think regardless of the, the, the place where you're applying, that teaching is going to go is, is going to be helpful. And there's going to be teaching development opportunities. So that there's a week-long um, teaching workshop when you start at Kalamazoo before the term, the fall term starts. And there are uh, teaching programs throughout the year and advising programs. So, I, I mean, I made some of my worst mistakes teaching my first year out. I did a postdoc at the same institution where I got my PhD. I got a lot of bad, bad stuff out of my system that year. <laughs> More? Yeah, I just wondered if you all feel like you're achieving a good balance between work and life. I feel like I've been asking a lot of professors about that, but that's here. And I wonder if there's a difference between our research one institution of arts in terms of if you feel like you're achieving that. I mean, there, there were a couple years there where I just went under, I mean, to be honest with you. I mean, you really just get swamped. Um, I'm on sabbatical right now, and I'm very my short-term memory is all I got, so <laughs> it looks great right now. <laughs> you, have, you have to be proactive about achieving that balance and, and learning to say no when you need to and so forth. It's not, not always easy. I mean, I think I feel like I have a pretty good balance. Um, you get crazy busy the first year is going to suck, right? I mean, the first year is just crazy. Um, and But I think that on, on balance, it, it's good, but you do have to say no. And um, But I feel like I have a much, much, much better balance than my friends from grad school who are at our ones now, um, who are not happy people by and large, <laughs> even though they have very prestigious jobs in a lot of ways. Yeah, I, I'm a very happy person. <laughs> <laughs> Love my job, I have a great family life, and find plenty of time for it. Maybe I haven't done enough service. So I'm afraid we have to wind down the kind of open part of the questioning. I'd love to um, give a round of applause to our panelists. For